right. We thank you for your giving. Appreciate you, everyone who gave. I do appreciate all that you do. We're in this giving season, and we're grateful for the ability to give. Amen. And also the ability to receive. Amen. And receiving is good, too. Amen. All right. Let us bow our heads, and then we're going to transition right into the Word of God for this morning. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. We praise you. We lift you up, God. We ask that you would illuminate our hearts and our minds, God. Allow us as we go through this sermon to God to get something, to gain something, to learn something, to be expanded. And God, I thank you that revelation knowledge will flow freely, unhindered, uninterrupted, and unchecked by any satanic or demonic forces. And we thank you and we praise you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray and let everybody say amen. All right, let's come on. Let's go with our confessions and get our Bibles in our hands this morning. Do what we customarily do. Repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I will have what it says I will have. I'm a part of Deliverance Temple. Where we love by living our vision every day. We connect with our creator continually. We confess our deliverance consistently. We commit to serve creatively. We communicate Christ's love compassionately. Father God, feed me your word. Come on, put your hands together this morning. If you believe you're going to get something. All right. Moving right into the topic for today, not wasting any time. It is simply this designer's desire, designer's desire. Normally we hear the phrase designer's original, but today I want to talk about designer's desire because I want to talk about the two words design and desire. And I, uh, as I heard uh, Sister Nietzsche talking and doing the confession and in the scripture, it talked about your desire. So it lets me know I'm in the right place. So. Let's put up a definition for designer to start off with. It is a person who plans the form, look, or workings of something before it's made or built, typically by drawing it in detail. So what you see existing was not how it started. Everything that we see normally started with a thought first. And then from a thought to a drawing, and then from a drawing, it's turned into something that we can actually handle and touch. So somebody designed it. And when something falls apart quick, it was poorly designed. Sometimes you get something and it's cheap, but it's cheap because it's poorly designed. And so when we think of the great designer, we think of the creator of the universe and put that uh, definition back up. Now let's switch it and think of it in terms of God, a person who plans the form, look, or workings of something before it's being made or built, typically by drawing it in detail. So let's go to scripture, Jeremiah 1, 4 through 5, and Mother Mitchell will read, and this will help us track where I'm going. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So the designer says before you showed up, before you came through the birthing canal, I was already in the process. This is actually before I formed you, I knew you. And so we call that eternity past. And what that means is when we showed up here, in human form, we are in the fallen world. We've forgotten everything we knew about God before we got here. But just because we forgot didn't mean he forgot. And so putting up point number one, it's a phrase purpose by design. So when you were designed before your daddy knew about you, your great great daddy knew about you. Your mama, your great great grandmama, God had a purpose for your life. He had a design for you. And just because you showed up here and you had troubles and you had setbacks doesn't mean there's still not a purpose hanging over your life. Now, not everybody lives up to their purpose, 
But those who do, who step into purpose, they find out there's an ease because it was like I was born to do this. There's a lot of things I'm not good at, but I was born to do what I do. That some of you, you were born to do, do you, were, you were born to cook. Some of you, even without an education, you are successful because you fell into your purpose. There are people who did not go to culinary school and can cook you under a rug. I mean, and they can put a meal together because that was part of their purpose. Don't let the world tell you just because you don't have this and that that you're not nothing. When you step into your purpose and your purpose is unlocked, you'll find out that life works better when you're walking in purpose. Now, on the flip side, y'all praising and, and clapping, but on the flip side, when you're outside of your purpose, when you not in your lane. People say stay in your lane. When you're in a lane that you do not belong in, you'll find out everything messes up, especially on the road naturally. When you drive in oncoming traffic, something bad is going to happen. We understand that when it comes to driving vehicles, but when you're in a purpose that God didn't have for you, you cause wrecks and car crashes and you cause issues. Somebody said get back to purpose because it was by design. So we, we find out that the designer, the first thing we find out about the designer, he has a purpose connected to you. Let's look at Jeremiah 1, 6 or 7, going a little further in there. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go. First and whatever thing, I command you, you shall speak. First thing we need to realize when it comes to our purpose is that sometimes there's a level of fear even attached to your purpose. Because it gets a little scary sometimes. Stepping out there on things that are not fully seen. We walk by faith and not by sight. God don't tell you everything at the beginning. you got to walk some stuff out. And so Jeremiah, even though God had formed him, had given him a purpose, and had designed him, Jeremiah said, I can't do this. I'm a little fearful. I'm young. And so I want to put up point number two. Fear messes with the design by distracting from purpose. See, the more you're in fear, the more you can't focus on purpose because your purpose is greater than your fear. But if you focus on the fear, you'll never see the purpose. If, if I backed out the first time I bought a home, I was scared. I bought my home in 2002, my first home, and I was married two years. And people I knew were still renting. Older people I knew were still renting. And here I am stepping out to buy a home and I was nervous and I was scared and people said, are you sure you want to do this? I don't know, but one thing I do know, I don't want to rent all my life. I don't want to give all my money to someone else and never have any ownership. So even though I'm nervous and I'm scared, I stepped out anyway because I didn't want fear to rob me of my purpose. And as long as you stay scared over everything, you'll never step into what God has for you. The designer designed it and he purposed it, but he's not going to push you in it. You got to walk some stuff out and you can't be scared of everything. I've never seen so many scary Christians. Don't want to try nothing. Don't want to do nothing. Don't want to go anywhere. All they care about is Muncie. There's more to life than just Muncie. You got to expand your horizon. You got to press yourself. But, but it's uncomfortable. Yeah, it's supposed to be uncomfortable. Nobody did anything great playing it safe. Sometimes you got to swing for the fences. And that means you might, lose. you might strike out, but keep on swinging. Nobody hit a home run who didn't swing. So you got to swing. I was talking to my cousin last night and we were talking about investing and he was giving me some information and some wisdom letting me know I'm still young to keep on trying, keep pressing. I could be like, well, I don't have a whole lot of money. Quit crying and step out and try something. If you always do what you've done, you always going to get what you got. 
But if you want something different, especially if you want something that's purpose by design, you got to get beyond the fear. Step out. All right, let's, let's go to verse 8. Let's see the response that God gave him. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Now, hold on. The designer says the reason why I'm asking you not to operate and function in a level of fear is because I'm not sending you by yourself. I'm planning to walk with you. You may not see me, but that don't mean I'm not with you. And some of y'all, you, if you're honest, you'd have to tell yourself the truth that this couldn't have been nobody but God. Because this shouldn't have worked out. This shouldn't have turned out. And somebody said, I got a lucky break. It wasn't just a lucky break, but God turned some stuff around for you because he's walking with you. Now, this is what the scripture does not say. It doesn't say I'm walking for you. It says I'm walking with you. So if you're standing still, God is standing still. He's not going to walk for you, but he's willing to walk with you. So you got to walk you gotta try you gotta do it don't be fearful step out so he was telling jeremiah listen i got i got you in other words before you got here and got scared i already had a plan for your life i designed it i purposed it you're lining up with where i need you to be so move forward don't be afraid so that brings me to point number three point number three the designer will deliver because it's the designer who understands what you're supposed to be and where you're supposed to be. So if you walk with him and you get in a tight situation, I need you to know that the designer will deliver. So you don't come to Deliverance Temple because you expect everything to be perfect in your life. You come to Deliverance Temple because you're going to get in some situations where you're going to need some deliverance. But the problem is, as long as I focus on the situation, I'll never find the deliverance. But if I focus on the deliverer, I can confidently say he's a way maker. He's a promise keeper. He's a miracle worker. He's light in the darkness. Wait a second. If he's light in the darkness, it means time's going to get dark sometimes. But even though it gets dark, if, as long as you've got the light, you can make it out of any dark situation. I'm so glad I know where the light is. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. All right, let's go to point number four. Moving right along. When your designer's purpose aligns with your desire, you know deliverance has come. So this is called designer's desire. So I'm not just talking about the designer God, but now I'm shifting to our desires. And the problem with our desires is not all our desires are good. Well, I want to slap Trish in the mouth. That may not be a good desire. I may try it, and it may not work out for me. So we work with our lower nature and it competes with our higher nature. So sometimes the desires we have are not all together right. So what do we do with that? Well, what I'm saying is when your desire begins to align with the designer, that's when you know you done got some deliverance. Because I'm doing things that I didn't think I could do. I'm forgiving folk that I didn't think I, for, I could forgive. Not only am I forgiving them, but I desire to forgive them. I desire to let it go. I desire to not worry about it because now there's an alignment. So something's happening in me where I'm getting some deliverance. I'm getting deliverance from self. The greatest thing you'll ever get delivered from is you. The biggest enemy is always your enemy. And so... When your desires begin to align, then you know something's happening in me. Something's changing. We, we go through metamorphosis. We go through change. And a lot of us, we go through the change as we get older in life. Some of the things we cared about, we don't care about anymore. And it bothers me to, to see an old fool. I can understand a young fool because he don't know a lot. But when you're an old fool, that means you live through life 
and you stayed the same. You, you never adjusted. You never changed. And I, I don't want to grow old and be an old fool. I may have some foolish ways from time to time, but I want some wisdom to come out of the things I say and do. So that means there has to be some alignment from my lower nature is going to have to give way to my godly nature. Let me go back to the cartoons. In the cartoons, they have a devil on one shoulder, angel on another shoulder. And they both are talking in your ear. And when you're younger, you don't know which one to choose. But after you've been beat up from choosing the wrong thing, I shouldn't have to compete. I know right from wrong by now. I know what I should be doing. And even going back to the simple things like the money issue, you know you can't afford to be giving folk Christmas gifts that you're going to have to be in debt for. Right. Well, but, but it's Christmas. It's going to be Christmas next year and the year after. And you're going to stay broke unless you adjust. So at some point, you have to have some alignment. And when what happens is when the alignment aligns with the desire and the design, you start figuring out things work well. In other words, I'm not, uh-uh. I, I, I'm sticking with a budget this year. I'm not going beyond that. And then you'll find out stuff falls on sale within the budget. And it looks like you've given more that people are like, wow, you really blessed me. And they don't know you found it on clearance, clearance, on discount, discount. It was nice, but you didn't have to overextend yourself because you found yourself in a line. I remember being young and I remember it's happened at least two times. When my dad sat me and my sister down and said, things are tight. We're not going to have as much stuff for Christmas this year. You're only going to get three gifts apiece. Kelly got upset. I was like, okay, whatever. Didn't bother me. But that was one of the best Christmases ever. Because even though it was tight for my parents, it was well for my uncles and my aunts. And somehow we kept getting stuff. And I learned a lesson that it, it uh, I don't mean to say it this way, but let me say it this way. One monkey don't stop a show. In other words, God has several avenues to get things to you. Just because one closes down, you oh, no, I'm only going to get three gifts. No, look and say, God will make a way. Maybe I only need three gifts. Or maybe God has shown me that I can do exceeding abundantly. Of all you could think. Uh, when was it? 2018? December 26, 2018. I went and picked up the Cadillac that I had been looking for that I wanted. I wanted it, but it was not in my price range, so I bought it used, which is wisdom. Learn how to let somebody else take all the, the beating, so I bought it used. But then I also realized, but I don't want to pay for this forever. And so I told you that I paid it off like a couple weeks ago. So the Lord blessed me, but I'm ahead of schedule. I'm several, uh, uh, several months ahead of schedule. So what am I going to do with that extra money? Spend it, spend it. Maybe I should save it. Since, I'm already, since I already had it going out, maybe I should put it away. Maybe I should learn. But I'm learning because I'm aligning with God and things are working out better in my life. All right, so having said that, I wanted to give us a natural example, but now I want to give us a spiritual example where we go wrong as Christians. Many times we don't understand this process. Go ahead and put it up there, the pizza delivery process. So a lot of us, we say I'm delivered because we're talking about delivered from. But it's not deliverance until it goes from from to to. I'm delivered from cigarettes. But you mean as a, a junkyard bulldog. So you just trade the cigarettes in for anger. So you were delivered from, but you haven't arrived to. So put the picture back up one more time. So if I order a pizza and I call them an hour later and say my pizza's not here, and they say, yes, it is, we delivered it. We saw the pizza man leave and put the pizza in his trunk. Just because he left from there doesn't mean it has gotten to where it's supposed to be. All right, you don't have to keep that picture up any longer. I'm saying that to say this. Just because you got saved doesn't mean you've arrived where you need to be. Yes, you're delivered from some sin, 
But if you haven't arrived in your purpose by design, you are still undelivered. You are still in process. And here's the thing. God, well, I'll go back to the example of me as the uh, person who ordered the pizza. I have a right to complain because it hasn't arrived where it's supposed to be. Sometimes you're mad at God because he's not doing what you want him to do, but you haven't arrived where you're supposed to arrive. He, he's placed the order in and everything has gone the way it's supposed to go, but there's something missing in the process and you cannot be satisfied until it's from to two. All right. Having said that, let's go on and let's add this uh, definition. Put this definition up. Desire. A strong feeling or wanting to have something or wishing for something to happen. All right, so here's what I'm unpacking for you. You really know how close you are to deliverance when you begin to deal with those strong feelings and those strong urges and those strong desires. And when you begin to have some level of control over those strong things. And I'm not talking simply about the sin that we call sin. I'm talking about the little stuff. The little stuff like I'm saved, but the doctor told you you got high blood pressure and you eat ham every day. Well, I just got a desire for ham and God's going to provide. No, God doesn't have to provide because you're not operating by design. Somebody told you if you keep doing it this way, it's going to cost you. And you're like, well, God's going to fix it. God's like, I'm not fixing of things that you can control yourself. So, sometimes we have to, through willpower, work on desires. Now, there's, there's different levels. It, it, it does deal with sin, but sin can, sin can be uh, problematic in the, in the sense that it deals with addiction. Once you get addicted, it's hard to have any control because what Paul says, you do what you even don't want to do. So, before it gets to the addiction level, in the basic levels, can you work on the basic levels to align your desires to simple things? Here, let me tell on myself, I'm, uh, I like the way my suits fit sometimes. And sometimes I realize, like today, I'm wearing my suit open. I'm wearing my suit open because when I tried to button it earlier, I realized the gut was pressing a little too hard. So it's easier for me to unbutton my suit than it is to change my habits because to y'all oh, he still looks okay but I know internally there's some adjustments that need to be made and so when you start making the little adjustments what you're doing you're saying to the designer that I, I can give you greater desires if you start with the small stuff in other words if you take care of the little stuff I can give you greater things somebody say greater things all right, so now we're, we're going we're gonna to leave from, from where we were, Jeremiah, and we're going to go to another verse real quick, another passage, and then we'll come back to Jeremiah. Do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. Read that one more time. You got you guys put it, put it right back up. Do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. All right, so here's the problem with our desires and the designer is that even when we try to adjust, it seems like people doing less than us get better than us. They, they, they do, but it seems like there's people who cheat their way to the top and I'm working hard, and so then you just want to give up. But it goes back to that fear piece. It said, don't worry about other folks. Here's the thing. you got to stop worrying about what other people are doing. you got to worry about what God has for you. And yes, other people may be doing the wrong thing and getting by, but you don't know when that day is going to come. You don't know when, when the, the, the doorbell is going to ring on their life, so you can't look at them. I always talk about the tortoise and the hare, the rabbit and the turtle who were racing. The problem was the rabbit was judging his success based on the turtle. The turtle was judging his success based on the finish line. So the rabbit is much faster than the turtle. 
the hare was much faster than the tortoise, but the rabbit looked at the turtle and said, oh, man, I'm doing good. And then he started chilling. He started relaxing. He wakes up, and as the story sees that he wakes up and the turtle is just crossing the finish line because he judged his success based on somebody else. Amen. The turtle just kept looking at the finish line and kept going. So stop worrying about what somebody posted on social media and you keep doing what God has for you. And it may be slower, it may not be as fast, but you keep moving along because the only thing you're worried about is the finish line that God has with you, which is the designer. In other words, and I say this all the time, and I'll say it again, since I drive a General Motors, since I drive a Cadillac, I do not use a Honda uh, book to figure out what's going on with my Cadillac. To, uh, yesterday, I had to change my windshield wipers, and so I was looking to figure out how it was done, and it was bringing up a bunch of other cars, and that wasn't helping me because that ain't the car that I have. I had to get to my manufacturer to figure out how it works for what I have. Now, are some things similar? Yes. But there's many things that are different. And if you mess up, you're going to mess up because you are using the wrong manual. So stop looking at Donald to figure out what God has for you. Stop worrying about Joyce to figure out what God has for you. You got to know the designer for me. I got to figure out what he has for me. And as long as I align with him, I'm going to be all right. So I'm not going to worry about anybody else. All right, so let's look at this. And here's uh, verse 2. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Not everybody that's on top now is going to stay on top. Some things are like grass. They're going to wither. They're going to fall. They're going to dry up. And so if you're always trying to hook up, and this is what they say, the grass looks like it's greener over there till you get over there. And so you may get over there and it's dying over there. So you're hooking yourself up with something that's dying. So God says, focus on the purpose I have for you because the wicked are actually going to fade away. All right, let's move to the next verse. And this will help us lock in. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Ah, so in other words, trust the Lord and focus on you being faithful. To the things that God has called you. Amen. Not everybody else, not everything else, but what does God have purpose for you? Now, once again, when you do life with other people, there may be some similar, similar commonality. So you may be doing things with people, but there are some specific assignments that God has for you. God may have Teresa on another path than she has me, than God has me on. And in order for Teresa's path, she may have to pray an hour a day. But Teresa can't tell me I got to pray an hour a day because that's what God got Teresa doing. Amen. So stop worrying about what somebody else is doing. A lot of times we get mad because folk ain't doing what you're doing, but God didn't tell them to do what you're doing. You do you, let them do them, and you'll see what happens. Now, here's the thing. If we get to a certain path and I say, Teresa, you're much further than I am. Can you tell me how you did it? That's when she can say, well, God told me to pray an hour a day. That's when she can offer her advice because I'm asking for it. Stop dropping advice on folk who didn't really ask for it because sometimes you're meddling in business that don't belong to you. All right, so we trust in the Lord and do good. Let's go back to that. I'm just going, trust in the Lord and do good. Look, you can come off of that. I just want to say that again. Sometimes Christians forget just do good. Some of y'all are just not even good people. I ain't talking about y'all. I'm talking about the folk over there in TV land. I'm talking about people who, who won't, when folk open the door for them, they won't even say thank you. I'm talking about when, when, when folk wave at you, they look the other way. But I'm saved and I'm sanctified, but you mean and you're ugly and you're not even doing good. How do you think you want to arrive at this great blessing place and you're not good? Oh, 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 let me, I forgot. People don't do that in church. I forgot. Some of y'all fake it. You fake like you're nice, and then you stab folk in the back. Even Jesus had a Judas on his team. So not everybody that's in church is actually good. 
I would rather deal with folk that are good. There's some folk in the street that sometimes are better than the folk in the church because at least they'll treat you good. When they have a sandwich, they'll share a sandwich. Oh, let me get off of that because sometimes you got sometimes you got church folk that don't want to share. Let me get off of this, but sometimes you have church folk that come to the church year in and year out and get mad whenever they talk about giving because you're not, you're not good. But when you go to the Pacer game and, and you got to spend $10 for a coat, you're all happy and excited. But when somebody says something about offering in church, you get mad because you're not really good. I'm not fussing at you. I'm just saying sometimes we just got to get back to being good people. And maybe God can bless us wherever we need to be. All right? So that gives us the point number five. We already talked about the latter part. We'll jump to the top part. So we talked about fear as a problem and distracting us. So now we choose trust over fear. Trust is hard, but trust is easier than fear. Trust over fear. So now let's look at verse four. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Ah. So the key is, it's not that all your desires are wrong. They just need to be aligned with your purpose. So if you trust in God, then you'll begin to delight in God, and then he'll give you the desires of your heart, which is two things. He'll give you what you desire, but if what you desire is wrong, he'll begin to work and change your desires. I told you before how when I was younger, I desired one thing and God told me something else. Like I, I said, I desired my first car, I desired a two-seater car. And the Lord asked me, how many people could I take to church in my two-seater car? And I got to thinking, wow, that was a pretty much it was a selfish prayer. I've been praying for several months over this two-seater car. But then I switched and started praying for a Jeep. Now I had five seats and I was able to take people to church and take people other places. So God was saying, as long as I wasn't so selfish and self-centered, he could bless me with bigger things. So I adjusted, but he's the one who gave me the thought because I wasn't thinking about nobody but myself, which is nothing wrong necessarily. Self-care is not selfish. It's okay to have self-care, but sometimes God will adjust your desire and make it bigger than what you started off with. So then he adds this. Let's look at this verse. Delight yourself in the Lord. We're going to the next verse now. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. I can't get God to do anything for me. Oh, you're not trusting, and then when you do trust, you don't actually commit things to him. In other words, you don't let him actually have things that you prayed about. You put it there, and you take it back. You put it there and take it back, and God says, as long as both our hands is on it, I'm not going to do anything. But if you get your hands off of it and actually commit your way to me and say, God, I'm going to do it your way even when it hurts, he said, that's the person I can use. That's the person I can use and align you with my greatest desire for your life, my purpose. All right, so that brings up point number six. Point number six is this. Trust leads to delight. Delight leads to desire. Desire realized leads to more commitment to the desire. In other words, when I trust in him, then I start delighting that at the end of the day, I get the things that I was desiring. That makes me say, hey, I want to do it your way more often. I want to trust in you more often. I'm going to try it your way more often. So actually, it's a blessed way for you to get the things that you desire. First of all, you align them with God, the designer, and then you get the desires, and then he begins to adjust the desires and you're like, hey, I kind of like this. Let me give you an example. In my own life, I always thought about a whole bunch of things that would make me happy, so to speak. But the older I get, just being with my family makes me happy. Amen. Just being around my wife and my kids and my extended family, being around the people I love, especially when you start losing people. Other people that you still have become more important to you. And you realize there's some good things like being on the beach is fun, but being on the beach and not having anybody to share it with is not as fun as I thought it would be. It's sometimes I'm more blessed than I realize, but I hadn't looked around to think about the people that I have in my life, in my space. And I'm so grateful for the people I have in my life, in my space, because now I'm delighting myself in God. And I'm realizing I'm more blessed than I realize. He's been giving me stuff, but I've been taking some of the things he gave me for granted. I tell you, especially as my children get older, I miss it more. Because the older they get, the less they really like daddy. 
I try to talk to them. They don't really want to tell me what's going on in their life. They, they're not really caring. Uh, they, I got them on Instagram. I'll send, I'll send Dylan Instagram memes and things, and he won't respond. That's just Dylan. Dylan, he, he, in his mind, he thought about it. But I miss the times the kids will run up and jump in my lap. And somebody told me that this goes fast, that life goes fast. And I didn't believe them until I was living it. So I encourage you, don't focus on the silly things, especially in this Christmas season. Don't focus on the silly things. Focus on the things that are most important, the love you can share with each other. Because that's most important. And that includes you and I. I'm, I'm grateful for those of you who are part of us, and I love you, and you mean the world to me. And I'm learning more and more. I always wanted to travel around and preach, and even though I've traveled around and preached, I still am grateful for the people I see every Sunday. Amen. All right. We've got to get us out of here. So here is Jeremiah 1.9. Going back to Jeremiah now. So we, we finish that up, come back to Jeremiah. Then the Lord put out his hand mm -hmm. and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Point number seven. Put up point number seven. We have become a part of the design team. Now it's not just about our desires. We're so hooked up with the designer that the designer has put his words in our mouth. And when we speak what he speaks, we become a part of the design team. Because the way, we, the, the way the system came in, the Bible says the Lord spoke things into existence. So now we can use his words and we can speak and we can be a part of the design team. So when we have things that we don't desire, we can start speaking the opposite. When we have negative, we can start speaking positive. All right. That leads us to verse 10. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Mm. I'm going to read that again and I'm going to read it slow. So we can understand this. It took me a while to catch this, but it says, uh, see, I have set you this day over nations and kingdoms. That's automatic. But it says to pluck up, to break down, to destroy, to overflow. Then it says to build and to plant. Here's the thing. Because we are hooked up with the designer, we think we get to build and plant right away. But there's a lot of things that need to be plucked up, need to be torn up, need to be ripped down. Whenever you go and you go and try to plant a garden, you got to dig up the earth first before you can plant anything in. And many times what happens is you, you, you're 15 years in your marriage. You're like, man, it still isn't working. You've been in the digging years. You've been in the pulling down years. You haven't got to the twilight years yet. You haven't got to the good times. So don't quit in the middle of it because you're still digging. You're still pulling up. But there comes a time where you get to build and plant. And even building and planting takes work, but you get more, uh, you reap more from it. So just because you are not getting your desires right now may not mean that you're not aligned with God. It could mean that you're still pulling some stuff down to get to the place you need to be. All right, so that brings us to point number eight, and this is our last point. We now understand the process of going from design to desire. We got to stay in it. We got to trust the process. We got to be willing to do the hard work, the healing. I told you before, and I'll say it again. I uh, Just last week, I was in therapy. If you need therapy, it's good to do, do it. Everything, everything may not come from a Bible. You may have to go to therapy. You may have to go to the gym. You may have to take medicine. You got, you got to use faith and wisdom because you're building and planting, but you got to pluck up. You got to dig up. It does, it takes some work. But once you get to where God wants you to, to be, the purpose that God has for you, you will not regret it. Can I get an amen? amen. All right, now we're going to do something special. We're done with the, the sermon. We got just a special thing that we're going to do. We're going to add, and then we're going to go from that into our communion. And we will do our communion together. I'll read it this time. All right, let's go to the very first one. It says, and he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. 
Deacon, would you serve your wife first? Everyone else will go ahead and we'll eat. All right, let's go back to our next verse. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Now let's drink. Let's bow our heads. We're going to pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, God. We thank you that many of us are moving into our purpose, God, and not just our brother Steve, God, but as we move into 2024, we're going to find ourselves more aligned with your purpose, and we shall have us more aligned with the desires that are right for us to have, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, and let everybody say, Amen. Amen. God bless you all. We love you. You're dismissed.